input in how the process works. And so this week you're going to see another example of us opening things up, an open rule, something we haven't seen in seven years here in Congress on the Strategic Petroleum Reserve Bill uh, that says if the President's going to raid SPRO, not during emergencies, but just in normal times, he at least has to show a plan for how he would replenish it. If you're going to take something away, you should show people how you're going to refill it. And what was interesting is that the president issued a veto threat on this bill yesterday. And it's important that you read the veto threat to understand just how misguided President Biden's approach to energy is. And in the veto threat, he actually said that his policies of rating SPRO have led to lower gas prices. Now, I don't know if the calculator is broken at the White House, but since Joe Biden's been in office, we've seen a 40% increase in gas prices. That's not lowering. It's actually increasing so dramatically that it's hurting hardworking families. It's one of the reasons that you pay more for everything when you go to the grocery store, uh, when you go to the shopping mall. Anything you buy now costs more money because of Joe Biden's policies, and he's trying to claim that that's actually lowered costs when, in fact, it's increased costs. And families know that. Uh, they know if you have bad energy policy, it makes our country less safe. It's not like we're using less energy. We're actually using more energy. It's just now we become more reliant on foreign countries. There's no reason for that. We have the most abundant supply of energy here in America. And by the way, if you're concerned about carbon emissions and from the sound of all those private jets going to Davos last week, uh, it seems like those, those faux uh, conservationists uh, seem to like talking in foreign countries about it, but they don't practice it here in America. Nobody makes energy in the world cleaner than the United States of America. So stop flying Air Force One to Saudi Arabia and other countries begging Russia to produce energy when we can make it here cleaner, better, lowering the cost, and uh, creating really good jobs in America. But in the meantime, we've got a strategic petroleum reserve for a reason. It's there for emergencies. It's not there to mask the president's bad energy policies. It's there in times of need, and this president's rated more than 40% of that reserve. This bill just says if you're going to raid the reserve, show a plan on how you're going to replenish it. And why the White House would issue a veto threat on that boggles, I think, the mind of most common sense people. But unfortunately, that's what we've seen commonplace from this administration. Obviously, there are a lot of other issues like the debt ceiling that the whip talked about that we are deeply interested in solving. Uh, but with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Yeah. Um, thanks so much. I was just wondering about the um, select subcommittee on COVID and uh, if you could comment on when those hearings are expected to start and also Will they be building on the work that you and Representative Jordan, Representative Rogers, and McCall did on this issue in the previous conference? I'm glad you recognize how important that work was that we did last year. Uh, look, I've talked to now Chairman Wenstrup. Brad Wenstrup was just formally named as the chairman yesterday. I think that, uh, that word went out. And we've appointed our members. Obviously, the Democrats need to appoint their members, so the committee is ready to start working. But once they get fully constituted, like all of our committees, with both Republicans and Democrats, they're going to go to work. But there are a lot of important issues, and I know we tried to address them in the last Congress, uh, things like the origins of COVID. And, in, in, of course, the select subcommittee on the coronavirus will be one of those committees, energy and commerce, a number of other committees will have jurisdiction as well. But we're going to be asking those questions. We never got the right answers on the number of nursing home deaths uh, that occurred in those states that went against the CDC guidance on how to take care properly of people in nursing homes, thousands. In New York alone, a minimum of 13,000 people died that never should have. Uh, but the number from what we've heard from people on the ground is a lot higher than that. Uh, but the governor's never released that data. So we, we obviously want to get answers for families. And, uh, and that's what that committee will be focused on. Um, on Schiff and Swalwell, Democrats are characterizing this move by Leader McCarthy to keep them off of intel as nothing but political vengeance. Wondering in response to that. And then secondly, do you know if Republicans are going to have the votes to keep Elon Omar off of foreign affairs? Well, with all of those uh, members you talked about, they're very specific things that they've done in their time here in Congress. I, I don't even think uh, Swalwell could get a security clearance in the private sector. Uh, so why should he be on the Intelligence Committee? I mean, these committees are very unique in that they deal with our national secrets. They deal with uh, very classified information. And if people have shown a propensity to either espouse anti-American, anti-Semitic views, 
uh, do things that have put themselves in a compromised position, including uh, lying about classified information. Uh, it raises serious questions, and again, those are very unique committees. You get access to a lot of classified information. Uh, you, you, there are a lot of members on the Democrat side that don't have those kind of conflicts, and you know, I know the speaker has urged Hakeem Jeffries to appoint people that don't have those conflicts. Are, are the votes there to keep them off the foreign affairs, though? Yeah, obviously. I mean, we'll see if they uh, they appoint her, but we we have no intention of, of having them serve on those committees. Yeah. Um, I think the facts are important here, and rather than reading this through the lens of the headlines, getting to the facts are important. Uh, in the case of Vice President Mike Pence, he came forward uh, and, and proactively reached out uh, and is following the process. In the case of Joe Biden, uh, he has had classified documents going back to his time in the Senate, where he started serving before I was born. So this is a long-standing national security threat, setting aside the very important fact that Hunter Biden also had access and used used as his home address where those classified documents were improperly and illegally stored. This will be a part of the oversight agenda and on the House Intelligence Committee we absolutely want to make sure we have all of the facts. Is there, is there a concern, we've seen it with former President Donald Trump, with Biden, with Pence, that you know, some of the top leaders just aren't handling classified information at all? Should there be some sort of reforms with how well, let's highlight the difference here in what the consequences have been. You had the FBI raid Mar-a-Lago. You did not see any of that happen for President Joe Biden, uh, who illegally did this. What also is different is President Trump, as president, has the right to declassify documents. So the media should cover the fact that the FBI has been weaponized against President Trump and clearly uh, has covered up for uh, sitting President Joe Biden. And to finish, and to finish up on that, now we'll go to other questions. But to finish up on that, uh, number one, President Trump had been working with National Archives and put those documents under lock and key. That the FBI then broke through to go get those, and then leaked photos. They laid the documents out on the floor, and they leaked photos out. Anybody asked where the leaked photos of the uh, Vice President at the time Biden's documents that he had uh, in his garage? I haven't seen those leaked photos, and also the fact that Justice had that information prior to the election and sat on it uh, and, and covered it up until after the election. There are a lot of questions, obviously, that are raised where there are big differences. Last yeah, we'll go over to this side. Mr. Lear, uh, if you could talk at all, and I know you mentioned that CLA, but how seriously are Republicans considering any form of entitlement reform, a national sales tax? Where are you on those discussions, specifically in terms of cuts in, or in these negotiations around the debt ceiling? Well, what we've been very concerned about is, number one, that debt ceiling is a symptom of the bigger Washington spending problem. And Joe Biden, for the last two years, went on a spending spree the likes of which our country has never seen. You know, $5 trillion in spending, a lot of it under the guise of COVID that had nothing to do with COVID, doing things like paying people not to work, where you have millions of people right now who are sitting at home that are fully capable of working and getting thirty, forty thousand 40000 in government benefits. That, by the way, undermines Social Security, because if those millions of people were working, they'd be paying into Social Security, helping shore that program up, which, by the way, we strongly uh, believe that Social Security needs to be strengthened for seniors who paid into it. What President Biden did paying people not to work actually undermined Social Security and expedited its bankruptcy. But the bigger question is, can we get spending under control in Washington? And if the nation's credit card, which is the debt ceiling, gets maxed out, you've got a few questions. The first is, number one, I think most families, if they max out their credit card, they're going to sit down and have a conversation about how to responsibly deal with the problem. If you're taking in less money than you're spending, that's the problem. We're taking in, by the way, a dollar and spending a dollar twenty-nine in Washington. So for every dollar we take in, Washington's spending a dollar and twenty-nine cents. That's not sustainable. And so sh for President Biden to say we can't even have that conversation, that's irresponsible. And so what Speaker McCarthy has said is, let's go sit down and have an honest conversation about how, how to solve this problem. If
want to touch that waste. He wants to defend that waste because he just wants to raise the credit card limit so he can spend more money. That's not a that's sustainable. That's not, by the way, how families deal with their own spending crises. So we're ready to fix this problem. We'll do one more. We'll do one more. Can you give us a quick floor update? Because there's been a couple bills that were supposed to come to the floor that haven't Border Safety and Security Act as well as Prosecutors Need to Prosecute Act. I mean, what's going on? Is this just growing pains of being the new majority, or is this going to be an ongoing issue? Given well, one of the things you saw during the speaker's race is all of us, not just some members, uh, because there was a universal agreement amongst Republicans that Washington's broken and we want to change the way Washington works. And so that's what the debate about the rules changes were. And, and frankly, we were in agreement on almost every change that was made. But one of the things you heard over and over again is members want to see regular order again. They want to see more bills go through committee. So some of those bills, look, we're going to be doing a big border security package that's going to go through the Judiciary Committee, through the Homeland Security Committee. They're just getting constituted. And so ultimately, you'll see those bills go through the committee process. Obviously, there's some bills we've brought up that have universal acceptance. I mean, look, last week we, we brought a resolution that should have passed unanimously that said we condemn attacks on churches and other pro-life facilities. We've seen Molotov cocktails get thrown into buildings. And, and if we can't all come together and say that's wrong, it has nothing to do with your views on abortion. Uh, but if somebody actually commits violence and throws a Molotov cocktail, which almost a hundred times since the Dobbs leak we've seen, can we at least say that's wrong? And almost every Democrat voted against condemning those kind of attacks on churches and pro-life facilities. Uh, that's a problem they've got on their side. But ultimately, on a lot of these bills, larger energy policy, border security, parents' bill of rights, uh, dealing with crime and communities, all of these issues will be going through committee in the regular order process, by the way, where you can watch this on C-SPAN. You can actually follow the hearings. You can go to them in person because we got rid of virtual hearings in committee. You'll actually be able to see members in the committee room working through these complicated issues and ultimately bringing bills to the floor that are going to finally start addressing the problems families are facing so we can get our country back on track. It's going to be refreshing, and I think a lot of people will be watching. I know y'all will, too. Thanks. Good being with you. you.